Oh, hello, I'm Paul Graham, I'm the owner and founder of uh, Graham Audio, which I started in 2010 uh, to build BBC licensed speakers. The reason we arrived at the BBC license was we were buying quite a lot of equipment from the BBC at the time, and we noticed that the loudspeakers that the BBC produced on the second-hand front, which we were selling, were shooting out the door. Um, and it was, it, it, it appeared that there was a, a market for the BBC speakers, the licensed version. So I approached the BBC then, and over a period of the first year, uh, we negotiated a royalty rate, and um, we arrived with Derek Hughes' help at building the uh, the LS59, and we did find we were proved correct that there was quite a large appetite for BBC approved loudspeakers. That's 11 years back. It took us 18 months to two years to get everything what we considered right. Mm -hmm. And we sold our first set of loudspeakers in November 2013. So this year will be our 10th year of trading, as it were, 10th year of trading of actually selling the speakers. And you know, people have said, well, they look rather austere, um, our speakers. Well, they are meant to be monitors, yeah. you know, and this is a style that we've adopted yeah. and we're very happy with um, because well, they still, to my uh, ears, sound uh, absolutely terrific. And they're very, very accurate as a, as a studio broadcast monitor should be. I, I think a lot of... Um, the, BB, the BBC heritage mm -hmm. spread out through most of the hi-fi yeah. because the various companies are English. So I think we're all, all been influenced by the BBC yeah. and the fact that it had to be utilitarian just to work well and it had to be moved between studios. Yeah. Uh, so it was less about the aesthetics. Yeah. And as you've seen with um, the five fives uh, at the floor standards behind me, yeah. They're quite unusual with the slots. It's <laughs> counterintuitive. But the trade-off is they just sound fantastic. And if you don't like it, you can always put the grills on. So you can cover them up if you want. But a lot of people have come around to uh, enjoying the way they look as well. It's, it's definitely the mid-range. Mm -hmm. Because the amount of time, man-hours that went into building these speaker is probably from what I can gather, more significant than most speakers ever because the BBC had huge amount of man hours. And then with Derek to help us translate that into a modern form, um, I think that's why, the, I think it's a successful recipe, I think. But a lot of it had to do, to begin with, with the amount of man hours that went into building the 5.5s five and the 3.5As. and no, no, the, a lot smaller. What, the 3.5As? The yeah, yeah. Well, again, um, Derek, who you'll speak to later, will be able to tell you more about how the 35A was developed and the amount of man hours that was put into that. Yeah. And we don't think that many companies now have the time or the, the resources to be able to build these speakers, which is why I think in that period when they were designing them in the 60s um, and to 70s, that's why it was a special time. And I don't think the designs have been bettered apart from we can use more modern materials to bring better drivers, yeah. but the actual dynamics just work terrifically well. Yeah. Uh, definitely, yeah. I don't think there's any doubt. I think after that period, from what I've seen, mm -hmm. uh, people went on for unique sell selling points, mm -hmm. not about that mid the mid-range and how neutral it is, and to just hear what the composer was trying to get at, mm -hmm. which is, we think in the mid-range, obviously. A speaker for everyone. We're getting to the point now where um, we won't be developing too much more because for a, a very small company, which we are, we've got the LS3, at the, the titchy one at the bottom end, and then we've got the Votu Marama right at the top end, which is 1.72 metres yeah. high and 120 kilos per set per side, as it were, and, and something in between. You hope for every, um, every size of room.
My name is Derek Hughes and I do the design work for Graham Audio. Um, I've worked in the loudspeaker and audio industry all my life basically. Um, I joined the BBC from school, 18, yeah. and then went on to join Spender Audio Systems, which my parents uh, founded. So um, then worked with my mother and father and then carried it on after my, my father died with my mother and then moved on from there. Tried to retire unsuccessfully <laughs> because um, I was up in exhibition and another manufacturer said, oh, you're free now, do you want to work with me? So I did that for a while. And then 10 or so years ago, I got an email from Paul Graham saying, I've got these BBC licenses, um, I need help with design. So a fateful day really, and uh, yeah. been involved with them ever since. But, and obviously the big initial job was sourcing or designing a, a bass driver yeah. because that's um, the foundation of the speaker. Um, so he involved me in that and we uh, involved Volt loudspeakers, who a British company who make uh, drive units. Yeah. Um, and then we've, we've gone on from there, yeah. The LS59, yeah, 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 which ironically is the latest, the most modern speaker of the BBC line. We've gone, we've gone backwards basically, so which is fine. Yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, so that was the LS59. That, that was the speaker that was used most widely in the BBC between, I suppose, 1982 or three. Mm -hmm. um, there's the LS58, which is a big speaker, um, similar dimensions to these. Yep, yep. Um, and then the LS59 was the next model on for smaller control rooms. But it's the one that there were most of in the BBC, and that's why Paul came across them, so, so many of them. Um, and it's quite a challenge recreating something like that. We got we had cabinet drawing, cabinet schematics, and that that was okay. Yeah. Um, the biggest challenge was drive unit design. Um, the the t the tweeter they used was Nordax tweeter, which was um, actually went out of production for years and came back in. Fortunately, just before, which is very good. So we used Nordax tweeter. Um, but the bass driver was the most challenging thing, and Volt um, have been have always made custom drivers. So um, we spoke with them and got them to do all sorts of samples and different cones and things like that, and then came out with the um, LS59 bass driver, and then I designed the crossover around those two drive units. Yeah. Um, crossovers fairly well, fairly complicated to a lot of compared to a lot of crossovers which BBC designs tended to be, yes. Um, because obviously if your aiming point is a flat response, yeah. which is basically what they're aiming for, then you know there's a lot involved in ironing out irregularities in the driver responses. So um, that was, that's the key. Um, so I mean, the LS59 was very widely used. Um, the, the BBC first started designing their own loudspeakers back in the 1940s, I think, yeah. um, because there weren't really any consistent drive, um, loudspeakers with a consistent response and sound available commercially. So they just started doing their own thing. Um, and then it's, that progressed over the sort of 30 or 40 years. And then... In the early 60s, 1960s, there was some very serious research and design work went into drive unit materials and cabinet materials. Um, because up to that point, uh, cabinets had been very big, very heavy, out of very thick wood, and incredibly expensive. <laughs> um, so there was uh, design work at the BBC Research Department to look at um, a way of improving cabinet um, manufacture to reduce resonances, reduce weight and reduce cost, if essentially. Um, and my father worked for the BBC in research department before he formed Spendor, and he was actually involved in that work. He was initially a mechanical engineer, so he did a lot of the physical design of things um, under the guidance of some extremely clever audio um, acoustics guys, who are people like Dudley Harwood, who many people have heard of. They're a group of about, I think it's 12 in the, in the research acoustics section. Um, 
And so, I mean, Paul's alluded to the cost. And so you had these 12 guys who were the top of the industry, really, yeah. just working full time on whatever projects the BBC decided to. Yeah. So the, the cost involved when you analyse it what is huge. Yeah. <laughs> they, they reckon with the S35A, which is this little speaker, yeah. that if you translated the man hours, it would have cost about a quarter of a million pounds to develop. But that's they just had the guys, because people ask me, oh, you know, how did the BBC finance it? Well, they just had a dozen people there yeah, yeah. who worked on projects. Off you go. Yeah. Um, and tremendous resources in terms of, of um, mechanical and electronic workshops, uh, huge test facilities. Wow. You know, so it was a... Um, I mean, that's the reason why it was a bit of a golden age, I think, that because the... There, were, there weren't research people and facilities anywhere like that. Um, just the pursuit of excellence in, in making our speakers. Um, yeah, it, it is incredible. I mean, I, as a teenager, when my father was working at research. I used to go down there at weekends sometimes with him. So right from, I think I was probably 15, 14, 15, when I first was exposed to all this wonderful technology, you know, I, I loved it. Um, so we go down there and we go into their big anechoic chamber and chamber and test things and stuff like that. So being exposed to that sort of technology at early age, I mean that's what I was going to do, obviously. So, yeah. so I then sort of joined the BBC for sort of seven years and then just moved into the industry. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, it, it helped because. Um, they used to design all these electronic gears as well down there. Mm -hmm. So what you, what they used to do is they used to design prototypes yeah. and then they go to London to be made into a production model. So every sort of half a year, yeah. they'd have all this stuff and they put it in the middle of the lab and say, well, look, this is going to go in the skip or you can take it home. <laughs> so so I'd, my dad would bring back these sort of you know, prototype sort of electronic equipment yeah. and loudspeakers and things like that. So we just had all this stuff at home, you know, to use. It is cool, and yeah. you know, you, you get immersed in that world, yeah. and it, it just it it really sort of um, adopts you, I suppose. And you know, and I, what I like liked about the BBC was this pursuit of excellence, yeah. almost at no cost. You know, the, you just went for the best, yeah. um, and that was their philosophy. And gradually over the the decades, they sort of evolved different. Um, refinements, if you like, to the fundamental principles, um, because consistency of sound was important. You know, you had to be, be able to. I mean, the BBC had well, hundreds of studios yeah. all over the the, uh, uh, the the country, so you had to be able to record something in one studio and listen to it in another studio, and it had to sound the same. Yeah. So, consistency of sound was the um, was the, very much the watchword in yeah. design. We've improved to the extent that better materials are available yes. and better processes um, um, in in the drive units particularly. Uh, yes, I mean modern modern magnets, um, things like that, modern co materials. Um, but uh, we were always building on the sort of solid foundation of the work was done in the sixties, um, and. Fundamentally, you can't um, beat good engineering. Good engineering is good engineering. Yeah. You know, you can refine it and things like that, but, but there's, there's certain fundamentals that you have to stick to, yeah. or it's best to stick to, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So we've tried to be true, even when we've done variations of the design and some of our own models, like the LS6, which are intermediate between the BBC license the, the models. Basis. We no, we still keep to that principle. Even the biggest loudspeaker we do is still what what the BBC are turned thin, damped thin wall, which yeah. is the way they designed it. Um, and I mean, these the LS five five was the first um, of their major designs to use the thin wall damp technique. So they went away from like three three quarter inch teak, which is um, to sort of uh, yeah, not twenty millimeter teak down to sort of twelve millimeter um, uh, or plywood. Most of them apply the BBC designs are plywood, 
um, with bitumen damping and also um, rock wall to, to damp uh, standing waves in the cabinet. So that was the work during the 60s that was done. And then that was applied, you know, through the subsequent designs. But, um, the little LS35A is a particularly intriguing story because it was, it, it was a design by accident. No. The BBC were working on scale models of studios, um, eighth scale, one eighth scale. So they had to, all the acoustical um, treatments had to work at eight times the frequency because it was an eighth scale. And they had to design a loudspeaker that worked at eight times the frequency up to a, what, about 100 kilohertz. So this, there's very intriguing BBC reports, which are all on, online about this process. Um, but one of the things they made was it was a strange, there was a, a ball of um, little mini tweezers for the high frequencies. Yeah. And then this little cabinet with a, uh, a small five inch driver in it. And the project was going as a project in, in terms of scale modeling. Yeah. And then uh, one day my father came back from work and said, oh, we had a very interesting thing. Someone thought, I wonder how this sounds because it was all just measurements. No one listened to the thing. So someone said, I wonder how it sounds. So they rebuilt a pair of them differently, put them in the listening room and thought, well, they sound quite good. <laughs> so, so the LS35A was all pretty much a, a happy accident. So then they decided that, you know, to develop it as a, as a standalone model. But and one tweeter, not, not the... Yeah, that's right, just the one tweeter, yeah. yeah. A different box and things yeah. like that. So they just tidied up the design for actual um, listening purposes. Um, and then it was adopted very much for mobile control rooms because um, they hadn't got anything reasonable quality and small. So it was considered good enough um, for, for general monitoring. It's um, that the, the BBC monitors are divided into two categories, A and, uh, and sorry, three and five. Yeah. So there's LS3s, which are general monitors and LS5s, which are critical monitoring, i.e. sound balancing for studios. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's the two, LS3 and LS5. That's the designation. Yeah. So things like the LS55 um, were the stu proper studio monitors Pretty for balancing cool. in you know, yeah. concert halls and things like that. Um, the LS3s were general sort of check monitors, if you like, mainly in vision areas. So yeah. people could hear it in reasonable quality, yeah. but they weren't thought of as you couldn't, you can balance on them as a sound engineer. So that was the two dist distinguishing, yeah. It's fundamentally to improve off-axis dispersion, yeah. linear, linearize the frequency response off-axis. It, it, it's simple in essence. Um, the, the bigger a drive unit is, <clears throat> the more it beams at high frequency. Yeah. So the slots, from the point of view of the air, make the drive unit, unit look narrower yeah. so that the off-axis response is, is yeah. smoother. Again, that there's a, a report that goes into all this and, and shows response curves and things like that, and some very complicated maths, which is completely beyond me. Um, but that was developed in 1967 was when the original version of this was developed. Um, and that was the first time the BBC had used the slots it's quite an old idea from the 1930s, in fact, but they sort of updated it as an idea to, um, because obviously in a studio you've got big mixing desk and you move side to side and you want the stereo image to stay reasonably coherent. So that's that's the idea between the behind the slots. Looks strange, um, but works very well. A bit. You know, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes.